So I want to, in the last of this provocation series, I want to turn the questions that we've been thinking about on the head slightly. Uh, our, our last two speakers and the introduction from Duncan at the beginning provided a fascinating overview of the array of challenges that face us and the possibilities that design might have in helping us to address those challenges, how design may, might help us shape the world and the environment. So I'd like to just maybe look at the opposite question. I've never been too good at predicting the changes that there are going to be in the world. Maybe, maybe we should talk a little bit about how the changes in the world, about the environment, about the social, cultural, and technological systems, the changes that are occurring right now, might change how we do design. And in particular, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the robot elephant in the room, if you like, uh, the oncoming idea of artificial intelligence, white collar automation, and how it might change how we all work. But I want to not look at that as an oncoming storm. I don't want to look at it as this, uh, this disastrous, disruptive, destructive inevitability, but instead as an opportunity to scale how we impact the world through design. Because even if we put every single designer in the world on the problems that we've just had so ably uh, described to us, I think we might come up short. We're going to need to change how we do this work. So if you'll forgive the uh, provocative title, I'm not talking about design by machines. I'm talking about how we can use machines, how we can use artificial intelligence to change, to improve, to augment how we do design. And I wanted to talk about this by first going through a couple of the things that exist in the world today that use artificial intelligence very overtly and very covertly, what they're capable of. Use those as a couple of touch points for how artificial intelligence works today. Then talk a little bit about how that might change in the next 10 years and maybe in the next 100 years pretty difficult in artificial intelligence. I wouldn't want to stake my career on what's happening next Tuesday, but we'll see what we can come to. So AI has, has really overtaken everything in our lives uh, already, but this is really just the, the, the start. We have algorithmic systems which are powered by AI that change the media that we consume, that, that help us uh, find places, help us move. Uh, but it's also starting to change medical systems. Uh, IBM's Watson has a, a, an interesting project in the uh, last couple of years looking at uh, detecting, identifying melanoma from, from pictures, uh, very, very early detection. And, and there are some uh, research systems at the moment that can caption natural images uh, relatively accurately, actually. A man in a black shirt is playing a, a guitar. Uh, the, the one in the top right is a slight error. There's no wakeboard there, but you can understand why it would make a mistake like that. That's a mistake a lot of humans would, would make. So this is generating that text from scratch, just given the image. There's a lot of power here in these sorts of systems. So I want to take you through a couple of these, and then we'll think about what would be necessary for these to help designers. So people probably remember the news last year about how uh, uh, Google's, uh, or DeepMind, a subsidiary of, of Google, developed this system that beat the world champion at Go, Lee Sedol. And it's tempting to think about that as just the crushing weight of CPU cycles, the overwhelming speed and power of a computer. But I want to draw your attention to a quote that was in one of the articles that came out at that time by a commentator on that match that was himself a, a world champion tier Go player. He said, Lisa Doll, after leaving the match room, left the room after a particular move was played in, one, in the second game of the series. He had to leave the room. He spent nearly 15 minutes putting together a response. The commentator said, this isn't a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. It's beautiful. The commentator, the world champion, was surprised. This thing was not merely copying the best humans and acting so quickly, but it had somehow managed to come up with something that was truly new. So there are moments, just moments, where our machines can begin to surprise us. We have to think about how we can use that in our practice. 
So this is another example that I think many people might have seen just to see the visual power of these kinds of systems. This is a natural image, the River Necker in Tübingen where this research was done. Uh, and then this is it rendered in the style of a bunch of very uh, famous paintings. So the system here takes a painting which, uh, which embodies an artistic style and another image and renders the latter in the style of the former. A lot of talk has been made about whether this is creative. I would argue, of course, no, it's merely, uh, maybe the person who put the thing together was creative, but the system doesn't know anything about Van Gogh. It just knows the style of brushes that were used in that particular painting. Still, visually fascinating. Has anyone visited any of these volcanoes? Does anyone recognize any of them? I hope not, because they're completely made up from scratch, pixel by pixel. These are not real pictures. These are the output of a deep neural network. So these give you an idea of the ability of a system to synthesize from scratch, not to modify, as in the case of that artistic style transfer. None of these exist. Of course, the system has seen a million, million pictures of volcanoes, real volcanoes, and volcanoes have a relatively simple visual structure. You draw a triangle, put some fire on top. Uh, but these look quite real. These systems do relatively well with more visually complex objects. This is from a couple of years ago. Uh, I am not an architect, but I'm told some of these monasteries don't even exist in three dimensions. Uh, so these are perhaps not quite as far there as uh, as the volcanoes, monasteries being more visually complex. Um, I do, however, have enough understanding of the structure of things to note that one of those birds doesn't have a neck, and one of the ants has two butts. So we have perhaps a little bit of way uh, to go. But even that we are there, these are generated pixel by pixel from scratch, after all, is an interesting thing. Did anyone see what these two were up to in the papers? I think you're probably onto my tricks by now. Neither of these people exist. They were generated from scratch, pixel by pixel, uh, by a neural network that had seen a ton of celebrity photographs. And we can talk a little bit about biases in socio-technical systems and what it means to have uh, deep learning researchers making their own perfect women from a, a database of a million celebrities. But that's a different talk, and perhaps a darker one. So this is where we're at, and they're quite cute. Although if you look at the eyes, there's just something that's not quite there yet. Everyone's a critic, right? So those, of course, those are examples of AI systems generating from scratch, literally tabula rasa, every, every pixel. But you can also do, uh, uh, add detail, add life, add depth, add realism to sketches. Now we're starting to talk about something that could uh, affect design. So these are sketches which have been turned as close as possible to real photographs by a neural network. Here's another example of the power of that. You can take a sketch and you can just with simple pen uh, draw on top of it, modify it, and then the system will try and produce real versions of that. Different haircuts, accessories, glasses, so on. So this starts to look like something that might change how we do design. But what's missing? What is it about design? What is it about how we think and how we approach creative problems that none of these examples quite have. I can see maybe a couple of faces in the audience saying, yeah, but none of that's design. But can we articulate what's missing from these systems? Because then we could perhaps try and build something that, that has it. I think the way to explain this is to go back to design theory from the 60s and 70s. This is some of the work of, of Donald Schoen. Uh, it says that design starts with an internal representation, an idea, and then produces an external representation. That's sketching something, getting something out onto paper. He calls this moving, a design that takes action, that we draw. And then there's seeing, reflecting on that sketch, reflecting on that external representation you have, and in doing so, changing the idea that you have in your mind. So this doesn't just mean draw and look at it and draw and look at it, but every time you do that, you draw something slightly different from what you were thinking, and then in reflecting on it, you think something slightly different than what you drew, sometimes very different. And it's that adaptation, that reflection and reinterpretation that really characterizes creative design. And that's the bit that none of those examples that I showed you have ever quite touched on. To give you a very quick example of this from a real world designer, uh, an architect, uh, a student architect was looking at how to arrange the classrooms in a, in a public school, uh, put them in a line to look at it and then reflected on it and thought, hang on, that kind of looks like the rises of a stair viewed from the side. 
reimagined the design to accentuate that, drew the six classrooms arranged in these sort of three L-shaped patterns. And then reflected on that again and said, you know, that creates some interesting sheltered, uh, half-enclosed spaces. I'm going to now, as the concept for my design, focus on these three semi-enclosed spaces as an interesting part of the playground space. No way I could ever follow, at least today, no way I could today follow that line of reasoning. Because the problem that they're ending up working on at the end isn't even the problem that they were working on at the beginning. It's not just that the solution changed, it's that the problem changed. And that, I think, is the core of how to make this stuff really work as creative design by machine. All right, so creative design so unique, as if you're saying we're, we're also great, how can AI really help? Well, the first one, and the one that I'm going to show you some examples from today, is in providing inspiration. The system won't have to do design. The human does design, but the AI can maybe stretch our thinking a little bit. And the second one that I just want to end on is actually how to solve those problems, how machines could learn to reframe, learn that flexible, dynamic, adaptive way of thinking about problems. So here's an example. These two sketches, the cat and the mouse uh, at the top, are. Uh, maybe that's a pig, the cat and the pig, are human sketches. In between, none of those are real human sketches. That is an interpolation, but not just an interpolation between the lines. Each one of those is conceivably a sketch of cat pigs and pig cats and somewhere in between. So you can build systems that can understand and then help interpolate, explore a space. Uh, on the left is a, a stimulus drawn by a human. This is the same system again. This is uh, something done by some folks at Google. And on the right is it auto-completing the sketches for you, giving you inspirations, giving you suggestions for fire, uh, fire trucks and for mo mosquitoes and for owls. The red section is the same in each of them, and the computer has filled in the blanks. This could be used for inspiration. Here's trying to play a little bit more left field. This is actually some work from myself and some of my colleagues in the US, where we're trying to say, OK, given a user's sketch, the stimulus on the left in each of the two columns, what's the craziest thing that the system can draw a parallel with? Well, this bridge looks like a rainbow. This axe looks like a dolphin. This bathtub looks like an aircraft carrier. These are very left field stimuli. But maybe they could help spark an idea, spark an analogy. Those, of course, those are all systems that, I'll just go back for a second, these are all systems that in one way or another provide us with stimulus at some point in the design process, uh, largely in the conceptual design process, that might be able to change the ideas that we're having. But how could a, a system actually do that by itself? Because as I mentioned before, real, true human-machine co-creativity, machines as collaborators, rather than as tools, will require this idea of dynamically reframing problems, this co-evolution in the terms of design theorists like Nigel Cross and Mary Lou Meyer, this co-evolution of problem and of solution. So when you think about it, machine learning constructs one way of thinking about a problem from a lot of data, from millions and millions of images. All deep uh, neural networks produce a representation, I won't get into too much, but it's a big ass table of numbers, uh, that comes from the, uh, the most optimal way within its parameters it can represent and uh, synthesize and uh, aggregate all of that data that it's seen. It gives you just one way of thinking about a problem. But designers, every time, they look at a, every time they look at a problem, they think about it in a different way. Every time they go back to a sketch just after getting a cup of coffee, they think about it in a different way. And critically, they do so from really quite little data. Designers may have a lot of experience, a lot of expertise that they're bringing to the table. But in terms of this problem, they've probably only seen a couple sketches. And that's a completely different way of thinking about this. So how could we do that? Well, uh, there are many different ideas. Uh, some of the work that we're looking at involves trying to understand the designer better, uh, try to model their psychological and cognitive processes like curiosity. Other approaches are about trying to build a machine that can embody that experience that I talked about, that expertise. Uh, trying to have a system that has seen so many problems in the past that it can look at a new one and frame it and uh, look at it in many, many different ways. 
But whatever the solution to these, whatever we're going to be able to do in 100 years, maybe even in 10 years, it will require this kind of breaking down of barriers that Duncan was talking about. If we want to really change the way we do this sort of thing, we're going to require designers, but we're also going to require artificial intelligence, science and engineering, and we're going to try require psychology and cognitive science to really put those uh, three things together and get us machines that can help us scale up how we design to solve the problems of the next 100 years.